Another commitment for Kenny Payne and the Louisville men's basketball program. We'll talk about what that means for next year's team on this episode of the Locked On Louisville podcast. Stay tuned. You are Locked On Louisville, your daily podcast on the Louisville Cardinals. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome into another episode of the Locked On Louisville podcast. I'm your host, Dalton Pence. For those who are not aware of who I am, I serve as a credential media member for Cardinal Sports Zone. I also do some PA announcing work for the University of Various Sports. I want to take this time, as always, to personally thank you for making us your first listen of the day. And just a reminder, the Locked On Louisville podcast is free on all streaming services, including YouTube, five days a week, your team, every day. As I mentioned in the cold opener, the... Louisville men's basketball program got another commitment for next year's team that came in the form of 2022 four-star small forward Devin Ree. We will talk about what a possible role could look like for him next season. We will also talk about the Cardinals and Kenny Payne reaching out to Missouri State transfer Isaiah Mosley, one of the top transfers in the portal currently and what he could bring to the Cardinals' rotation next season. And then finally, we will dive into the weekly mailbag segment. But we'll start out talking about Devin Reed. The Cardinals received the commitment from the four-star small forward over the weekend on Saturday. Um, This was supposed to probably be the first commitment of the Kenny Payne era. Um, But... It seemed like maybe Devin Reed was looking to make some more visits, but ultimately at the end of the day, he set an announcement date for 5.02, uh, May 2nd, which is uh, pretty neat considering it would be 5.02 day, but he ended up moving that announcement up to Saturday at like 3 o'clock Eastern time, and he announced that it would be the Louisville Cardinals. So the four-star small forward is the ninth scholarship player On the team for next season, the team has four open scholarships left. But in terms of the wing department, which is what uh, Devin Reed fits into, um, really not much competition at this time. You know, you look at Kamari Lands, the other 2022 signee, who it would be in direct competition for minutes. Mike James, if Kenny Payne and company views him as more of a three rather than a two, you could then look at Mike James to be in competition for some of those minutes at the wing. And also... Another possible player could be J.J. Trainer, and whether or not um, you know he's viewed more so as a wing rather than a big man. So a lot of questions that we're going to be looking forward to getting answered as the offseason goes along and depending how Kenny Payne and company fill out the roster. But as I mentioned, the first time we talked about Devin Ree and the Cardinals getting involved in his recruitment, it's, it's exactly what – you know, we're looking for for next year's team. It seems like um, when you talk to a lot of the fan base, it's, okay, you're asking the question, what does this team need? Well, it has the front court support, especially with the addition of Brandon Huntley Hatfield and the announcement that Roosevelt Wheeler is coming back. There are two main components for next year's team that seem to be lacking at this point. Um, Number one, that's guard play. We'll discuss that in the second segment, Um, L. Ellis being the only guard, but also perimeter shooting. Um, Outside of Ellis, who's a very respectable three-point shooter, you have a guy like Kamari Lance, who is, you know, um, one of the better shooters in the 2022 class. But outside of that, yeah, Brandon Huntley Hadfield, Jalen Withers, J.J. Trainer have all shown the opportunity and the ability to knock down the deep ball, but not necessarily can be relied upon as a solid perimeter shooter at this point, at least not in the preseason. And then Sidney Curry and um, Roosevelt Wheeler are more of a um, you know perimeter or not perimeter uh, interior threats, um, so to speak, on the offensive end. So you have L. Ellis, you have Kamari Lance, and then Mike James, who. I thought displayed some solid perimeter shooting as a senior in high school, a lot better than I thought um, he was going to be at this stage in his career. There's just a lot of uh, uncertainty. You don't necessarily have that knockdown shooter, so to speak. And even if L. Ellis is able to take the next step forward, even if Kamari Lanz is as, as good as advertised, you can never truly have enough shooters. Well, Kenny Payne and company go out and get one of the best pure shooters in the 2022 class. For Oak Hill this past season, he appeared in 32 games, averaging 11.2 points per game, um, shot the ball extremely well. 
um, 48% from the field, which is very solid. The staggering number, however, is the 44.7% from behind the arc, making 51 of his 114 total attempts. That is absolutely incredible at any level. Um, especially at um, you know a level where you're where you're playing a lot of solid high school competition. So you know at six foot eight, what 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 would his role look like for next season? Well, I think that that's kind of uh, kind of dependent on well what what do the cards do in terms of filling out the roster? If let's say if if, if Amani Bates is added to this roster, that makes things a little bit more interesting because now you're taking away some of those possible minutes at the three. Now, whether or not Kenny Payne, you know, uses some of the versatility on this roster to, you know, play different players in different positions depending on the situation and depending on the scenario. Like, could we see Devin Ree at the two at times? I think that, you know, he has solid ball handling, um, you know, projects as a possible three and D player for next season. Uh, I think that his direct competition honestly is going to be with Kamari Lance for some of those rotational minutes. And like I mentioned, really just kind of depends on how Kenny Payne fills out the roster, but overall a solid recruiting victory for the Cardinals. The former LSU signee um, was let out of his national letter of intent and formally decommitted from the Tigers program. When Will Wade was fired, um, the four-star prospect is ranked as the 75th best player. Actually, he's higher. He's highly rated, or he's more highly rated, I should say, on other recruiting services. Like on three, I think has him in their top 50, which is big time. Um, but he's ranked in. He's ranked as one of the uh, 20 best small forwards in the country. I know that Auburn uh, was another school um, trying to, you know, obtain. Yo, his commitment, um, you have a couple of other different programs, but very, very solid. I just think that having a shooter who is able to not only excel in catch-and-shoot situations, but also be able to um, dribble into his own shot, um, you know, just being able to create off the bounce. Um, now, th that's the question that I, I was asked the other day is, is Devin Reese strictly a shooter, or is he a player that is – predominantly a shooter, but also has some other things that he offers to the table. And I think that, that you know, as much as predator shooting is his forte, I, I do think he is like Kamari Lands in a sense of, I, I, I do think that he has an underrated ability to get to the basket. I don't necessarily think um, he's as good as Lands when it comes to, you know, penetrating the defense and getting into around the bucket and scoring around the bucket. But uh, I think that, Allowing a player to, um, I guess you could say, utilize their skill set both, you know, behind the arc and being able to create off the dribble. I, I, I really like Devin Ree's ball handling for his size. I think that his ability to um, work into his own shot and, and get to the spots on the court that he likes, it's going to be a solid addition for the Cardinals. I think that, um, you know, it seems like a good amount of the fan base sees Devin Ree as a two and done type prospect. And I think that that's, that might be a little bit generous just because um, it, it's hard to, um, you know, per, you know, make some projections on these guys when we haven't even seen them play a, a single minute of college ball. But I, I, I think it's fair um, because year one, depending on, I mean, especially if the car, if the cards get Amani Bates, it's going to make things a little bit more interesting in terms of playing time. But I, I'm excited I'm excited for Devin Ree's skill set. I think it's it's exactly what this team needs is another solid perimeter shooter. I could see him coming in next season and playing, you know, 10 to 15 minutes a game, um, being a a player that's really relied upon for perimeter shooting and that um, is able to be on the receiving end of one of the Louisville guards, whoever that may be. You know, maybe it's Tyrese Hunter, maybe it's Isaiah Mosley, maybe, you know, it's L. Ellis being able to, you know, drive and kick out to Devin Ree. I definitely could see him uh, being a very, very solid threat from the perimeter, especially in the, you know, in, in the respective corners um, and, and just being a spot up shooter. But I also think that he has the skill set to be able to work into his own shot. So the best thing that could happen for the Cardinals next season is if that shot is fully translatable and it translates extremely well 
to the college level, and he comes in shooting well. I think that defensively, he also is able going to he's, he's also going to be able to see the court due to his defensive versatility, being able to guard two through four, uh, depending on the the matchups. But I, I'm I'm extremely excited for this commitment for the Cardinals. I think that he's going to play a role next season, regardless. Year two is kind of where I have um, kind of where I have the thoughts of him possibly making a a case to be an NBA draft selection. So it'll be interesting to see how he, um, you know, performs in off season workouts and heading into the preseason. So, but like I mentioned, this Louisville roster is far from finished at this point because there are four open scholarships, but there's one guard on the roster right now. One true guard. You might think of Mike James as a guard, which is fine. You know, Kamari Lance could probably play guard Devin Ree as well, but um, you know, strictly from a position standpoint, one guard on the roster, but you have four spots to address that. Well, one of the possible options is Missouri State transfer Isaiah Mosley, one of the best transfers in the portal currently. Um, we'll talk about that here in the next segment. If you're watching this on YouTube, you won't hear any of the, um, the implemented advertisements. Um, so keep a note on that. And obviously if you're listening to, if you're listening to this on various streaming services, you're going to hear those implemented ad reads. So, um, enjoy some reads from our sponsors. And as always, I want to say thank you again for making locked on Louisville your first lesson of the day. And just a reminder, the show is free on all streaming services, including YouTube five days a week, your team every day, Isaiah Mosley is a type of player that can change the whole dynamic of the ceiling of your team, especially for the Louisville Cardinals who have one guard on the roster currently. And that is L Ellis, who in my opinion, like I've gone on the record saying multiple times, and I'm not going to shy away from that. Now I think that L Ellis has all ACC caliber. I think that he has the talent to really, really uh, make a impact on next year's squad. Um, but what I will say, and obviously he cannot do that alone, I still think that the Cardinals need a true number one scoring option and a solid backcourt running mate for L. Ellis. And I think that Isaiah Mosley, the transfer from Missouri State, could be exactly what the Cardinals need. Um, the 6'5 transfer from Missouri State has heard from a plethora of schools since entering the transfer portal last week. Uh, Kansas, Duke, DePaul, Mississippi State, Texas, Louisville, Oklahoma, Texas Tech. That is according to Rivals recruiting analyst Travis Graff. Um, Travis has been on top of the recruiting scene for the Louisville men's basketball team. And Isaiah Mosley is one of the best transfers in the country. Hasn't necessarily been ranked. Um, according to 24-7 Sports or according to the other uh, recruiting services because it, it, he is kind of a new addition to the transfer portal. But he's a back-to-back all-MVC. I, I believe Missouri State is in the um, Missouri Valley Conference. I could be completely wrong. I apologize if I am. But um, the back-to-back all-ACC, all all-MVC first-team selection averaged 20.4 points per game last season to go along with 6.2 rebounds and 2.3 assists. One of the most explosive and dynamic scorers in all of college basketball, according to multiple um, you know, analysts in the college basketball realm. He is in the transfer portal, but is still seeking feedback from uh, scouts in the NBA draft. So there is a chance that he could end up staying in the draft and end up, um, you know, not going to college at all next season, and that is a very real possibility. But it seems like there there's a lot of attention from other schools to where it kind of points that he's definitely um, – it's probably leaning in the favor of him coming back to school, um, but obviously not at Missouri State. But you do have to address that there is a possibility that he could still stay in the draft. But I'll be honest, the main thing that excites me the most about Isaiah Mosley – is the efficiency on the offensive end. Look, he is a number one scoring option. The past two years for the Bears, he averaged over 19 points per game. I mean, you're, we're talking about a guy that is, I'm trying to pull up the field goal numbers and, and exactly, you know, see how many he's taking. 
So, I mean, he, last year he's averaging just about 15 field goals a game. That is a very, very good amount. But the thing about it is what makes this such a critical possibility for the Cardinals is the efficiency. He is – he was, I, I should say, past tense because the season's over. He was a part of the famous 50-40-90 club. That is something not a lot of players are able to do at any level of basketball, especially in the collegiate and professional ranks. What I mean by 50-40-90, that is a player that fits into the categories of shooting 50% overall from the field, 40% from behind the arc, and at least 90% from the free throw line. So um, I think that the opportunity speaks for itself here, right? Because um, you get a player that's extremely efficient, but also is able to be a volume scorer. That is something that the Cardinals need. They need a number one scoring option. That was the pro one of the problems last year. They didn't have a go-to score. So in close games, in games where they were able to, you know, uh, claw back out of a deficit and, and get, the game within striking distance, they really weren't able to go over the hump. And that I think that that is a byproduct of just not having a number one scoring option. That's why Carly Jones in the 2019-20 season was a critical, or I'm sorry, 2020-21 season was a critical addition to the Cardinals program because he won the Cardinals a handful of games that season, um, whether fans want to admit it or not. And I'm not saying that we need him to come in and average 25 to 30 points next season. But I do think you need to have that number one scoring option um, in terms of – um, what he was able to do this past season. I want to read out some of these stat lines because he really showed up against some of the best competition that he played all season. Had 28 points and 10 rebounds in the NIT against Oklahoma, against Drake in the Missouri Valley Conference Tournament semifinal. 27 points, 5 assists, 5 rebounds. Had 33 against Bradley um, in February, 22 against Valparaiso. Um, 40 points against a ranked Loyola Chicago team that made the tournament 43 against Northern Iowa 32 against Valparaiso again and so on and so forth. I mean, this is a guy that has really, really um, left his mark on the Missouri Valley conference, not only in the scoring department, as I mentioned, average 6.2 rebounds, 2.3 assists um, projects more as an off ball um, score in at the I guess you could say at the next level at the power five level or wherever he decides to go although he's going to have some uh you know shot creation ability so I could see him getting the ball in isolation in the half court um, but I definitely think that um he his role would be best suited kind of playing off ball and playing off screens uh it is a very crafty score does not need a ton of room to score um can make a ton of tough shots I think it's it's interesting watching players make tough shots look easy and making tough shots, like literally legitimately making buckets, making tough buckets look easy. And Isaiah Mosley is a player that has that quality. Um, also, I, I like the, the strength around the, you know, around the paint. I think that he is very solid and has a ton of body control when he's going downhill and attacking the rim to where, you know, he absorbs contact and still is able to finish strong. And as I mentioned with his six, five frame, uh, offers a lot of size, solid defender as well. So I think that there are a lot of great qualities that Isaiah Mosley would bring any collegiate program. If if I had to guess, he's probably a top five transfer in the portal currently. Um, one of those being Tyrese Hunter, uh, one of those being Imani Bates. So the Cardinals have a ton of opportunities to get extremely better before the beginning of next season. Isaiah Mosley um, just makes too much sense for the Cardinals. Um, overall, this is a situation to where uh, I think it might be a little too early to tell um, who's leading. I know that there is um, some rumors that Kansas is interested in Isaiah Mosley. Um, now, obviously, being a national champion or coming off of a national championship title, it, it's kind of hard to really argue uh, or, you know, recruit against Kansas. But, you know, Louisville has shown that, you know, they can really – do wonders if they're able to get a recruit on campus. And then Kenny Payne, obviously, Nolan Smith, Danny Manning, great recruiters. So um, I, I'm interested to see if this does become a battle between Louisville and Kansas. Um, you know, what are you looking at in terms of, um, you know, a possible winner in that recruitment? I will say that the pitch that Louisville is able to make to Isaiah Mosley, look, it's very simple. 
it's this. We need a starting two guard. We need a number one scoring option. And we need you know a guy that can come play big time minutes at a big time program like Louisville, one of the collegiate blue bloods of history. You can come here, you can compete for uh you know, you can compete to get into an NCAA tournament, which obviously I think if you get Mosley and get one of Imani Bates or Tyrese Hunter, you're looking very good for next year's team. I think that you're going to make the tournament. I think that Louisville's gonna make the tournament regardless next season. But ultimately it really all comes down to some of the additions that they make with the remaining four spots. I think that the the pitch that Louisville is able to make, it, it's pretty pretty straightforward, but it's very, very enticing because there aren't that many programs, especially blue blood pro- programs, that can offer you that much playing time and that big of a role. For Kansas, Kansas is in a little bit of an interesting situation too because they're losing a good amount. Um, David McCormick is going to the pros. Um, Oshai Abaji is going to the pros. Christian Brown, it seems like, it will likely stay in the draft. Jalen Wilson being 50-50. They don't necessarily, and I, I guess you could say Remy Martin is gone as well. They don't necessarily have their number one scoring option defined right now. It's a lot of players that um, have to prove themselves. So, you know, Kansas has a solid recruiting pitch as well. But I, I think that if if you're looking at, you know, side by side what the, the best opportunity is, well, uh, it, it's hard to go against, you know, Louisville's pitch. And I'm not saying Kansas's pitch is bad at all because it, obviously playing for Bill Self, competing for a national championship, especially, um, you know, with a lot of players leaving. So there, there is the possibility there. Uh, but I think that either place that he were to go, if you did choose between Louisville and Kansas, he would be sort of a, a secondary facilitator um, and kind of a, um, uh, a you know, half half of the time ball handler, so part-time ball handler. You have Dewan Harris who's going to be handling some of the point guard um, uh, roles and responsibilities of Kansas. L. Ellis is the um, Louisville counterpart of that. So – I do think that this move makes sense for both parties. For Mosley, you go to a school that's a collegiate blue blood. Yeah, you play in some of the greatest facilities in basketball, in college basketball, and you know you have a solid role cut out for you. And for the Cardinals, well, you're adding a number one scoring option, one of the best transfers in the country, a do-it-all type of player that can really change the dynamic of next year's team. So I think that this move makes a lot of sense for both parties. So um, we'll continue to talk about the basketball realm in the – upcoming week and weeks i guess i guess i guess i should say um, but for today's conclusion of the episode we will dive into the weekly mailbag we're going to do that here in just a second after we talk about our friends over at bet online betonline.net is your number one source for all of your betting stats and sports info find all of the latest sports developments league reviews and news including this year's basketball playoffs and the start of the major league baseball season bet online Stays being your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends in action. Bet online is where the game starts. So, this week's mailbag edition, um, I will say it is dominated by basketball questions. Um, there is one football question, however, um, I-, I won't be able to get into all of them, but there are some good. Uh, questions that um, I would like to address. So the first question, this is one that I've kind of seen pop up all over the Twitter sphere, the Louisville Cardinal Twitter sphere. Um, it, it reads, do you see a situation to where the Cardinals add both Tyrese Hunter and Isaiah Mosley? If both players are willing to join the program 100%. I don't think it's a question. I think that, um, yeah, you may have now, now you may have three guards, um, you know, that you would be running, um, and, and you possibly one doesn't start. Uh, you know, you have L. Ellis, Isaiah Mosley, and Tyrese Hunter. Um, honestly, I could see an instance to where all three guards may start. I get it. L is about 6'2, 6'3, uh, Tyrese is 6'1. But with Mosley being 6'5", um, depending on who the four and the five are, I think that you know playing a three guard lineup, which you know teams have shown across the country that it can be successful, um, I, I think that it, it's it's a possibility. But you can't turn down the opportunity uh, to have one of the best uh, defenders in the Big Twelve and the Big Twelve Freshman of the Year, and also a back to back All NBC uh, First Team selection 
that has you know been one of the best scorers in college basketball for the past 12 months. So I think it would be a no-brainer. Uh, obviously, I think Kenny Payne knows that as well. It's kind of just compete or competing, convincing both of those guys of your of what the vision is for both of them, and um, trying to get them to coexist because you obviously have to incorporate the uh, chemistry aspect of it into it. But yeah, I think it's a no brainer if both of these players want to come to the program. Um, the next question is: Let's assume that Imani Bates, Tyrese Hunter, uh, I'm sorry. Let's assume that Amani Bates, one of Tyrese Hunter and Isaiah Mosley commit that leaves two open spots or one if both come. What would be the ideal? Um, what would be the ideal uh, player or type of player that you would bring in for the final spot? Sorry, I, I couldn't read that at all. My handwriting is is kind of atrocious at this moment. But um, so I think that um. It kind of depends on who that third recruit is. Obviously, if you had Imani Bates, you should be done addressing the wing position. Um, you know, bringing in Tyrese Hunter um, and bringing in Isaiah Mosley. Um, obviously, you have three solid rotational guards. I mean, you have probably your best, um, you know, some of the best guard play in the ACC at that point. Um, but regardless if they get uh, one of them or both of them, I think that you need to continue to address the uh, guard position, um, whether that is going out and getting um, another guard transfer that you can use in a rotational sense, or maybe it is a uh, 2023 recruit that you can um, you know, convince to reclassify to the 2022 class and possibly you know uh, sell the vision on – uh, playing rotational minutes for year one, in which you know they were supposed to be a high school senior, and then year two is when they're really going to break out um, when they have some more opportunities. But I think that it, it would kind of have to be guard play, especially if you do get Amani Bates, because you have five members uh, between the four and the five. You know, you have Sidney Curry, JJ Trainer, Jalen Withers, um, Brandon Huntley Hatfield, and Roosevelt Wheeler, and then the wings you have uh, Mike James, Kamari Lands. Um, Devin Ree and Imani Bates. And look, I get it. Three of those four wings have never played a single minute in the college realm. Uh, but I do think that they're talented enough to be able to hold down the wing position. And also, if they're not for some reason, then you do have a player like JJ Trainer that can fit into that. And also, um, you know, 6'5", Isaiah Mosley kind of sliding into that position as well. But I think just um, being able to go at least too deep in the guard play, in the guard play depth of rotation. So ultimately, that's kind of where my head is at. So just continuing to address guard play. Um, the last question that I think we'll be able to get to today is kind of going into Malik Cunningham's final season with the Cardinals. Um, statistically speaking, it would be hard for Malik to top what he did this past season. And although he has the potential to break some of Lamar Jackson's records this season, what are the prime indicators of development for Malik Cunningham in the 2022 season? That's a very, very good question. I think that a lot of it, you know, obviously statistics have to be there. He can't be a guy that uh, throws more interceptions than touchdowns. A completion percentage is something that I'm looking for as well. Uh, maximizing his yards per carry whenever he is scrambling. Um, but I think a lot of it is also can you know, comparing to the eye test as well. I want to see him become more confident in his reads, not hesitating, especially throwing the ball downfield. I would like to see him um, get a little bit more accurate when it comes to, you know, throwing the ball in the intermediate routes, not necessarily over the middle or uh, down in, you know, check down opportunities, but more so in the, uh, you know, in the, in the posts, in the uh, deep slants, um, you know, so on and so forth, especially with no Tyler Harrell. I'm interested to see you know who he's going to build chemistry with in that wide receiving room. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's kind of a combination of both. I want to see him uh, continue to do some good work in the stat sheet, but also I, I want to see him become more confident in his ability to make reads. I want to uh, you know see him um, you know, become more confident in decision making, avoiding hits uh, when it comes to you know scrambling. 
um, throwing the ball away when needed. He showed uh, some you know substantial growth last year in that department, but just continuing to get better at the little things and um, overall um, just making big time winning plays and going out there and reaching a new level that we maybe not necessarily have seen from Malik Cunningham so far in his career at Louisville, but ex- extremely excited for what 2022 could bring for the Louisville signal caller. Um, but hey, that's going to wrap up this uh, Tuesday edition of the show. Thanks again for making us your first listen of the day. Tomorrow's episode is going to be a little different. We're going to talk about some former uh, Cardinals that um, reached deals with some NFL teams um, after the NFL draft. We're going to talk about Donovan Mitchell's um, very abrupt playoff um, exit and also some more players entering the transfer portal across different sports. Um, Before we get out of here, uh, I want to give a shout out to the Locked on ACC podcast. If you're interested in learning more about Louisville's opposition or just the conference as a whole, 30 minutes of coverage every day from the Locked On Podcast Network for all of your ACC news. But like I said, that is going to wrap up this Tuesday edition of the show. Everyone have a great day. Go Cards. We will see you right back here.